Our galaxy is a dangerous place for life, a vast storm of stars in which new ones are born and die in deadly displays, as we gobble up smaller galaxies and whole planets are irradiated or ejected into the void. How much of the galaxy is truly safe for life to emerge in? Today we'll be examining the concept of galactic habitable zones both in terms of where, and when, life might have arisen, and where we might be able to safely make homes, even with entire regions of our galaxy being fairly hostile to life. We will also examine other galaxies and ask if our own Milky Way is more or less hospitable than most galaxies, and if there were periods where our galaxy might be more or less hospitable. We will also ask if this might play a role in the formation of hypothetical alien civilizations. When it comes to the Fermi Paradox, and the big question of where all the intelligent alien life is, we have discussed many different scenarios, and the three big ones are that they hang out here all the time but we're just blind or in denial, that they are very common but we just have problems seeing or hearing them, and that intelligent life is just very rare because the so-called Great Filters prevent life forms from making it through. This channel has no official stance on which category is right, because none of the proposed solutions seem without their flaws, but we definitely tilt toward the Great Filters camp, that life may or may not be abundant out there, but that intelligent technological civilizations are not, either because they occur rarely or that they don't last long when they do pop up. The latter we refer to as late filters, for options like self-destruction by nuking yourself or never mastering interstellar spaceflight. For my part, I like the Great Filters theory, but of the many proposed filters, I tend to feel it's less of one thing being a quadrillion to one chance of occurring, and more of a lot of lesser filters acting as cumulative hurdles and just weeding out candidates at each step on the road from life beginning to mastering spaceflight. However, even so, we cannot ignore the conditions which form planets before life even begins, nor events from beyond a planet and even its solar system. While asteroids might wipe out dinosaurs and bigger ones might rip the whole crust off a planet, as we think happened to early Earth to form our moon, there are a lot of things out there in the galaxy that could seriously hinder development of habitable worlds or result in one being destroyed or rendered uninhabitable. Much as each star should have a habitable zone around it, a place where a world like Earth could exist with liquid water oceans and oxygen-rich atmospheres, we can contemplate habitable zones inside our own galaxy or others. We can also contemplate this in terms of not just spatial regions, but periods of time. Much as our sun has changed its brightness over time, growing hotter and brighter, and thus has shifted its habitable orbital zone, our galaxy has also changed a lot since its early days. With that in mind, our goal today is just to examine not just where life might form, but where humans and terrestrial life might safely venture. And that requires a big initial caveat, because as show regulars know, we have some fairly extreme terraforming and bioforming options available to us that probably would let us put space habitats which you or I could live in safely. This includes those within spinning distance of the monstrous black hole at the galactic core, about 24,000 light years away from us, and massing 4 million times as much as our own sun, or 4 million solar masses. So where life can start and thrive is not the same as where technological civilizations can make a home, but that core is a good place to begin. That black hole is not really very big compared to the galactic center, which in turn is tiny compared to the wider galactic bulge. If you drew a sphere around Earth one parsec or 3.26 light years wide, you wouldn't find any stars beyond our own sun there, except maybe some unknown brown dwarf. The nearest known star is Proxima Centauri, over 4 light years away. In the past though, there have been stars closer to us, probably within a light year and probably several times, as stars move and migrate, but at the moment that sphere is empty. At the galactic center that same sphere will contain about 10 million stars, dominated by red giants. The core is a place where the usual refrain about space being really empty just isn't true. Planets can still form in this region, but given how many supergiant stars are there, and how often novae or supernovae occur there, and the constant perturbations of many close stars on everything there, it's not likely to be a place in which life could dwell even if a planet did manage to form, and cool, and exist long enough for abiogenesis to occur. There's also that brightness. 
Earth is 1 AU or astronomical units from our Sun, nearly a hundred million miles. If our Sun were made a million times brighter, its habitable zone would extend a thousand times wider, 1000 AU to Earth-like sunlight levels, not 1 AU, which would still be far short of a light year as a light year is 63,241 AU. What that means though is that even in the galactic center where stars are millions of times more tightly packed, most of that space is lower on sunlight than we are. Even if their night sky never has less light than our full moon anywhere, photosynthetic life could not plausibly exist in terms of available light energy. Also, surface life would have a hard time existing anywhere in this region, because regular supernovae, various powerful gamma sources and x-ray bursts would make it so difficult to survive, or keep surface water or air. We also need to understand that the galactic center isn't really a terribly unique place in the galaxy. Indeed as we were discussing a few weeks back in our look at colonizing other galaxies, our local group of galaxies really consists of tons of minor galaxies in various states of absorption by the Milky Way or Andromeda, and many of those have their own lesser galactic central regions, many of which currently orbit either galaxy, often inside what we call the galactic disk, the wide but thin disk where most stars in spiral galaxies are located and which give them their characteristic look. Ultra-compact dwarf galaxies often have a radius of only around 100 light years, but might contain as many as 100 million stars. For context, the 100 light years around our own world contain 60,000 stars, so an ultra-compact dwarf galaxy is packing more than a thousand times as many stars into one place, and yet I'm reluctant to say such a place is hostile to life, especially as concerns of radiation really only apply to surface life on planets like Earth, not deep sea life, like we might find in oceanic planets or icy moons, and not Hycean planets like those we discussed last month. That example was an ultra-compact galaxy, but that's not the only type. The Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy is an irregular dwarf and one that's the closest dwarf galaxy to us. It contains fully a billion stars but over a larger volume. Furthermore, the prior record holder for the closest known dwarf galaxy, the Sagittarius Dwarf Elliptical Galaxy, which itself contains four globular clusters, is nearly 10,000 light years in diameter and masses roughly 400 million solar masses. Indeed, not only are there lots of dwarf galaxy core remnants, dozens in and around our galaxy alone that we've identified, which are often very dense, we also have lots of globular clusters, and indeed the dividing line between them can be hard to pin down. Omega Centauri, the biggest known globular cluster, is suspected of maybe being a core remnant of a disrupted dwarf galaxy, rather than a globular cluster. If it is, at 16,000 light years away from us, it would be the closest dwarf galaxy. Some of you might recall we used it as our setting in our Extragalactic Sanctuaries episode, and it is a region about 150 light years wide and contains 10 million known stars, mostly red dwarfs, with a combined mass of 4 million suns, same as the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Or the supermassive black hole anyway, there are almost certainly dozens if not thousands of other black holes within the central region of the galaxy. Nor is our galaxy particularly big. Even if it's an Andromeda, each contain more mass than all the other galaxies in our local group. The Milky Way and Andromeda are each on an order of a trillion solar masses. There are galaxies out there with more than a hundred times that mass and sprawling over a million light years, and indeed our galaxy is a fairly remote one too, being inside a cosmic void. Such mega galaxies, or more dense regions of galactic superclusters, might seem likely to host far more planets and thus far more life, but they may also be hostile areas, too heavy on radiation and perturbation. Now the galactic central bulge is very dense, containing roughly 10 to 20 billion solar masses, but while the center is where a lot of the new stars form, the bulge is mostly made of old stars, those more than 9 billion years old. Now traditionally we thought that it was roughly spherical, but these days we think it got stretched into more of a peanut-shaped or barrel-like shape from one of those mini galactic modules. It should be noted that in many ways it is actually much easier for us to look at other galaxy centers than our own, as we had to look through a thick plane of the galactic disk to see ours, and indeed this region is called the Zone of Avoidance. Which sounds a bit scary or intriguing, but it just means it's bright and difficult to see through, so astronomers avoid trying to look through it. 
We do a lot of our observation of the galactic core by looking at other ones, which ironically means if our galaxy had something very odd about it that made it more hospitable to life than other galaxies, we might easily miss it by assuming it is fairly normal and filling in our observational gaps and shrouds by using other galaxies. This is an example of where we don't know if we should be using the mediocrity principle or anthropic principle to look at our existence. Globular clusters or dwarf galaxies and remnants are not the only places that are dense with stars. Stars often form in large nebulae as open clusters that slowly spread and dissipate as they orbit the galaxy and get tugged on by neighbors and shoved around by supernovae as the larger members die sooner. Larger, younger versions of this are often called superstar clusters, and we see this often in events of starburst, where a dense formation of new stars is occurring, which we believe can also be a periodic event where a pair of galaxies are merging or its galactic center is disrupted, or possibly collects a thick ring of gas around it which replenishes after formation. There's also no guarantee the right elements are in place for life to emerge, as contrary to popular belief, not all atoms bigger than hydrogen and helium are formed from giant stars exploding, many are formed principally by white dwarf detonations or by neutron stars ramming into each other. Stars in more remote places may also form with lower metallicity, which is the percentage of things besides hydrogen and helium in them, and the relative abundance and scarcity of elements can play a huge role in the viability of life beginning and flourishing as we discussed in our episode on the Fermi Paradox and the Phosphorus Problem. Stars can only form from cold gas, relatively speaking. It might sound a bit weird to think of space as hot, but temperature is about how fast individual particles of gas are moving, and because stars form by pulling particles in that aren't moving fast enough to escape their gravity, star formation occurs in cold gas, though cold is relative here and might be as hot as a rocket flame. How much heat a region has, in terms of energy, is about how much matter we have there and what temperature it is, so that a pot of lukewarm water can have more heat than an equal volume of very hot air, very high temperature particles but too sparse to give the area much total heat. We also have regions of the galaxy which are maybe too sparse for life to have emerged, and we want to ask why that could be, since one lone star in its wards far from others should be safer from calamity. There are even stars, probably many with planets too, which are entirely ejected from our galaxy and on which life might one day evolve and be unable to see stars in the night sky and maybe not even a faint blob of a distant galaxy. But principally, the reason a star might be alone is that it got perturbed away from where it formed, which often rips planets away in the process, and planets form from the same protostar nebula as their sun and with a similar initial ratio of materials. But when a star ignites, the solar wind off it, along with other radiation, slowly strips hydrogen and helium from less massive objects, leaving more rocky planets behind like Earth or Mars, or the bigger Hycian worlds, which are young and massive enough to retain much of their hydrogen. Stars which have low metallicity are what we call Population 2 stars, which again are very common in the galactic bulge near the center. Population 2 stars are generally older stars though they can be relatively new, even a billion years old, if they formed somewhere relatively low in metals but they mostly date to old times with less accumulated metallicity from supernovae and other metal forming events like neutron star mergers. Collections of Population 2 stars may be very low in planets, having only Sithonian remnants of hot Jupiters or small asteroids. So on the one hand, these stars, when old, would have more time for life to evolve, but also be less likely to have planets for life to emerge on and thus might be rare to have it, or even so rare as to basically be never. Ironically, any examples of first life, which might include us, are likely to be from places that are atypical, so it is entirely possible the first civilization to arise did so on a population 2 star, and might have had a rough time finding any raw materials in space or plants to colonize their own solar system or neighboring systems. Of course that also depends where in the broader galaxy, as for instance, there are giant elliptical lobes north and south of the galactic core which we call Fermi Bubbles, probably caused by the core's supermassive black hole, which jets out plasma, and these are regions devoid of stars but high on hot gas and gamma and cosmic rays and are also probably high on ultra-high energy neutrinos, which is a relatively recent and baffling discovery, 
Such an area though might not be super hospitable to surface life either. Why surface life? Well in terms of whether or not life exists somewhere, whether or not it is on the surface sucking up sunlight to power itself is not a strong indicator. Our current lead theory for the origin of life here on Earth is that it formed deep in the ocean, well shielded from very powerful radiation sources, and photosynthesis took quite a while to evolve. In that context it should hardly matter if a planet was in some cluster of stars where supernovae and x-ray bursts were common, or if its orbit around the galactic core of many millions of years swung it through such places occasionally. But fundamentally, the Fermi Paradox isn't about where life can exist, it's where life can plausibly evolve to have the technology and longevity to leave a visible and enduring mark on the galaxy which we might detect. Essentially what we call loud aliens, which we would tend to assume means that it was and potentially still is capable of practical interstellar spaceflight and colonization. Hopefully in the next few decades we'll be able to start spotting biosignatures around exoplanets and then we might be able to deduce how common such life is likely to be, and the answer might be very nearly every star system, or that the whole galaxy is devoid of even simple microbes, outside of this pale blue dot. But the conditions for a world with life to become a world with vast biodiversity and sheer biomass Earth has, which we assume is the easiest path to intelligent life, is one very dependent on being able to use sunlight for fueling the bottom of your food chain. That means an atmosphere that isn't so thick that sunlight can't reach the surface without heavy attenuation, which also means that it must be one thin enough that its and the life below can be badly mauled by a nearby supernova. If your surface life is restarting every 10 million years because the ozone layer gets ripped off and ruins most of your surface biosphere, you're not likely to make it to space. So too, if you are in a region where stars all whirl around near each other, rarely more than a few thousand AU apart, then even a planet in a stable orbit around one star is at some point likely to have stars pass close enough to burn them. How would Earth fare if for the next year we got twice as much sunlight and much of it coming from a different direction so as to illuminate the night? If such close encounters were occurring every hundred thousand years, which is not that high a frequency in such a dense cluster, then your surface life would undergo mass extinction by incineration regularly. Now we can't imagine ways around these problems which life might be able to pursue, or with some luck bypass that danger, and they may occur sometimes and might make for the basis of some good sci-fi stories. Isaac Asimov's classic novel Nightfall comes to mind, about a civilization that has six stars lighting their planet. Of course we can't really have a real idea what conditions are truly antithetical to life or intelligent life, and Robert Forward's equally classic novel Dragon's Egg even explores how life might evolve on a neutron star, so we are essentially speculating off what we know about Earth's life and our assumption that intelligent life evolves rarely. Not to tangent off, but a lot of the best sci-fi is about what-if scenarios in weird environments, or how humanity adapts to them, even if it is a less popular topic to write about in sci-fi these days. Anyway, this is essentially the crux of the concept of galactic habitable zones. Does a star exist in a place where its planets will get blasted by radiation? Does it have too low a metallicity to have planets, coming from a region dense in old stars? Does it pass through regions where supernovae or other powerful radiation sources are frequent, or where planetary perturbations can occur? If so, then it would seem the odds are stacked against life emerging and thriving to eventually become technological civilizations. But what about technological civilizations migrating to such regions and surviving, or even thriving? With science and technology on our side, many a barren radioactive wasteland might become a paradise and that includes places like the galactic core itself, indeed we can even contemplate moving or dismantling stars if it came to it. But such extreme measures aren't necessary for basic human habitation. With the use of star lifting, a civilization can acquire all the metals and heavy elements it needs even from metal poor stars, and reduce dangerously old or large stars to manageable levels. Normally I'm a huge fan of space habitats, specifically because they are low on mass compared to planets for the same living area and can be tailored, but even more so in the core regions or other areas where radiation is a problem, and where micrometeors might be far more common and higher speed. So living on the surface isn't wise, and living inside a routine habitat is better. Less mass savings though, 
as you probably want to put a thick superstructure around your habitat, maybe hundreds or even thousands of meters of shielding. Of course in terms of mass usage, a planet has thousands of kilometers of ground under every step, so it's still a big saving. It is also likely to be a place where our normal approach of using lots of thin and cheap mirrors for power collection will need improving, as they are likely to get worn down far faster by such an environment. And so too, spaceships will need greater armoring and shielding, and thus more fuel, though on the other hand everything is closer together. There is really no reason why humanity might not settle the actual core of millions of stars packed into a few light years, where our classic notion of a galactic empire from space opera becomes far more plausible than it normally is in a no FTL universe. All our normal options like Dyson swarms and mass extraction from stars or larger planets remains entirely viable, so as a whole this is a very tempting region to colonize, you just need to be ready for truly powerful emissions of radiation. You would live in bunker colonies and your spaceships may get cooked if the local space weather forecasts weren't accurate. On the end of this, speaking of mass extraction from stars, this makes even incredibly small areas of space habitable via star lifting, where even the poorest of metal poor stars still contains huge amounts of metals compared to the asteroid belt. As we looked at in our Deep Space Habitats episode, even areas without suns can be thriving and prosperous space settlements. Truth be told, it's too many suns that represents the only likely bar to life evolving in a region that might otherwise be habitable, and that may extend beyond regions of a galaxy to regions of galaxies. As mentioned, the Andromeda and Milky Way essentially both make up two halves of a bigger galaxy with tons of minor galaxies in and around them, and the Triangulum Galaxy is a distant third place in mass in our local group of galaxies, it is not that dense a region of galaxies even compared to our local sheet, the relatively flat plane of space in which many other galaxies exist, the bigger dozen of which encircle us and are called the Council of Giants. And yet this region is actually very low in galaxies compared to many other superclusters. We and most of our own supercluster of 100,000 or so other galaxies exist inside a vast cosmic void called the KBC Void or Local Hole, a rough sphere 2 billion light years across. Obviously Void is rather relative here, since it has many thousands of galaxies inside it, and we live in one of the sparser regions of main galaxies and galaxy filaments. As we mentioned earlier, there are galaxies hundreds of times more massive than our own, and there are collections of them far denser than the region where we are at. They can also be far more active in terms of their nuclei, not simply the ultra-powerful quasars which seem more common in the past, but lesser forms that could potentially sterilize their own galaxy during periods of eruption as active nuclei, and indeed that might be far more ominous if it turns out life originated on comets via panspermia to planets rather than the more popular deep sea thermal vent or tidal pool options. This brings up the time factor too, because quasars seem to have been most common and active 10 billion years ago, and as we mentioned earlier, when thinking of galactic regions and habitability, we need to think in terms of not just space, but also time. 10 billion years ago is about when the first Population 1 star was formed, those with more metals in them than Population 2. Most formed then would have been Population 2, and the oldest Population 1 stars are still very low on metals, about a tenth of what our Sun has, having been born about 5 billion years ago. Metallicity isn't just about time for individual stars and nebulae, it's about the local accumulation of metals from various supernovae and other nucleosynthesis events, and that rises with time. So 10 billion years ago, vast quasars were at their peak in terms of quantity, gushing radiation over many young galaxies, which were often smaller then too since our own galaxy is not unique in its cannibalistic tendencies. At the same time, metals to form planets would be very rare. Imagine a planet forming around a star 10 billion years ago that was high in metallicity for its time, but still just a tenth of our own sun's metallicity. It might have its largest rocky planet not be the mass of Earth, but a tenth of that, a mass parallel to Mars or Mercury fewer big moons, fewer big asteroid belts, just worse odds all around. But every year that would improve, every year the average metallicity of newly forming stars would be higher, and the odds of having big rocky planets would rise with it. 
Every year the areas grow more stable too, with galaxies merging and the era of quasars trailing off and periods of active galactic nuclei growing rarer or more mild. Eventually life would have emerged and emerged somewhere that surface-based life could thrive with decent odds of not being obliterated by some cosmic event or local asteroid. The question is, was this the place where intelligent life first emerged, or was it luck and in spite of extreme conditions that some unexpected world first became a cradle of civilization, or even not in spite of but because of such harsh conditions? Time will tell. As we improve our ability to peer deep into space and time, it may be that we are the first civilization, or even the first life, and it may also be that life that emerges further down the road, in distant galaxies, that may look at our world and think that it was a statistically unlikely and harsh place for life to begin. But if I had to make an educated guess, I would say our planet has been very fortunate in its composition and the stability of the Sun in orbits and in not being saturated by massive asteroids and ionizing radiation bursts all the time. Either way, now that we are here and developing, as we venture out to claim the stars, with a bit of hard work and ingenuity there should be no zone in our galaxy we are unable to inhabit. So some folks had mentioned in the comments on recent videos that the volume was getting louder on the background music, for good or ill, and I was sure I wasn't mixing it any louder. For some background context, I have partial deafness in my left ear from my time in the army and so the speakers on my desk are more on the right side. Well I went to my doctor the other day and she's looking at my ears and, short story, she found an earbud tip in my right ear, which had apparently given me an ear infection and some serious congestion headaches the last few months. The culprit was a pair of earbuds I'd gotten online a few months back for after Raycon had sent me a new model of theirs. I wanted to compare them to something in the same price range, I knew it lost a tip, I just assumed it got lost in the carpet. I'm not quite sure what the moral of the story is, but those other earbuds just didn't have very good sound quality, and one thing I disliked about them was the poor fit and how it fell out of my ear, most of it anyway, my Raycons have never randomly left an earbud tip inside my ear for months, and they've got comfortable custom gel tips. They've also got good sound quality and they are durable. I accidentally wash my original pair and they still work. They also let me walk too, I can have one or both in to leave an ear free or set them to noise isolation or awareness mode, depending on whether I want to minimize background sound or need to be able to hear things around me, like my kids, and you can change back and forth, raise or lower volume or answer phone calls with quick easy taps on the earbuds, which will not fall out of your ear when you tap them like many others do. Sound quality, durability, battery life, and listening experience are important, and it doesn't have to break your budget to have them, so treat yourself to crystal clear audio quality for work and relaxation and feel the difference. Are you ready to buy something small with a big impact? Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash IsaacArthur to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. So the newest issue of Ad Astra Quarterly hit last week. It's the magazine of the National Space Society dedicated to the creation of a spacefaring civilization, and it's full of inspiring, educational, and insightful articles, including one by me, the first of hopefully many more editions that I'll have an article in, I'll link to it in the episode description. And we still have plenty of upcoming episodes this April, starting with a discussion of nuclear energy and small modular reactors, and an update on the state of that industry next Thursday. Then it'll be time for our monthly Sci-Fi Sunday episode to contemplate super weapons, from the kinds that blow up planets all the way to things that could rip holes in reality or kill universes. And in two weeks, we'll look at the possibility of life forming on giant moons, like Yavin 4 from Star Wars or Pandora from Avatar, how such strange non-planets function and if we might want to colonize such fascinating places. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.